Welcome to the Online Bodyguard Podcast with host Philip Rindell, CEO and founder of Diffuse, a global threat and intelligence consultancy that blends psychology and intelligence to mitigate threats and risks to prominent people and brands. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Online Bodyguard Podcast. Uh, right, so this is going to be a really good one for me because I'm, I'm going to be speaking today with uh, probably my best friend. He was my best man at my wedding, so he, he knows all sorts of secrets about me. And then for 30 odd years, um, Miles Manning. So it's going to be really like a masterclass in crisis management, managing incidents overboard, over, overseas, supporting families in crisis from a commercial and personal perspective, and really kind of getting people and organizations back to their very best when they've hit a crisis. So Miles has had a 35-year career, which began in the Royal Air Force, um, and then uh, he joined the Metropolitan Police Service, which included postings on the Homicide or Murder Command in Covert Policing and the Counter-Terrorism Command. Miles worked closely with the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and in 2011, he became one of the small number of family liaison coordinators on the Counter-Terrorism Command dealing with atrocities in Algeria and Kenya. And Miles was responsible for actually pushing for more involvement on, on scenes. And in 2015, following the attack in Sousse in Tunisia, Miles led a team of FLOs deployed in a country within hours for the first reports. Uh, he's worked with multiple agencies, local government, crisis response companies, and his team assisted several families with identification and repatriations of loved ones. He's also led a team that deployed to Brussels and Marseille, as again as part of the FCO's rapid deployment team. And certainly when I was in Parliament and we had the attack on Parliament, I know that Miles was uh, very much involved in supporting some of the families that were tragically uh, it wrapped up around that. Uh, since leaving the police, Miles has been providing training to the holiday industry and, and lectures in many universities across the country, providing insight for the students around what happens if they find themselves in a mass casualty event overseas. He's also the family liaison advisor to the all-party parliamentary group on deaths abroad, as well as providing support and his extensive experience to advise corporate clients dealing with families who are affected by the death or the serious injury of a loved one abroad. That pretty much sums you up, doesn't it, I think? I think in 30 years, that's the nicest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> <laughs> that's only because you gave it to me. <laughs> so listen, so g give us some highlights and about, you know, some of the insights and highlights about your time as an FLO. Shall we start with what is an FLO? Well, an FLO is the link between uh, the family, the investigation, and also um, uh, the, the, it's a single point of contact is the easiest way to say it, between the family, the bereaved, you know, the murder victims and and the senior investigating officer. And it comes out at the time when the, uh, the Stephen Lawrence debacle, when unfortunately um, it didn't, it was, it was really, really poor in, in many, many areas but especially in terms of, of the family liaison. And one of the things that McPherson, Lord McPherson, did in his report was specifically recommend that there should be better lines of communication. And he actually mentioned the words family liaison. Uh, and he said it was really, really poor, as I, as I said. And in those days, it was. It was you know, murder squads, very insular. Uh, they didn't really uh, liaise with the families, they didn't liaise with the community. They just got on with what they were doing. And uh, nothing really happened until the family didn't really know much until the court date. But then after the McPherson report, uh, they set up this role um, called a, a family liaison. And I was really, really a family liaison officer. I was really, really fortunate uh, to be uh, on a murder squad at the time. So I was one of the first sort of uh, officers that were trained in this, first cadre officers that were trained. And in those days, Primarily, we acted as, as an investigator. So, you know, we were had this immersive relationship with the family. Uh, and the idea is, you know, obviously, you know that in most cases, uh, the murder victim knows who, who, who their, their murderer was or is, is, is associated, the associations there. So um, our, our job there was to try and get as much information about the family, the victims' associates as, as possible. And at the same time, guiding them through this really, really complex procedure of when someone dies in, in these sort of circumstances. 
and uh, you know taking them through all the sort of identification processes all that sort of stuff taking them through all the way through to court and all the complexities and, and challenges that, that that brings and really really supporting them practically uh, you know, doing, you know, helping them if they've got issues at work, speaking to employers, if they've got issues, you know, at, at home, trying to sort that sort of stuff out and making their life as as easy as possible so they can deal with the, the enormous sort of tragedy that, that has fallen upon them. And at the same time, we would then be looking to sort of provide uh, signposts them towards sort of mental health uh, support uh, as well. Uh, we don't provide that, and that's really important. That an FLO, a family liaison officer, does not provide uh, that sort of counselling service, you know, because that that is up to the professionals. And you could, because your relationship is so so close with with, with your with your your victim's family, it is a danger and and, and it's a big problem uh, uh, that we have to make sure that we we, we sort of step aside from and, and don't do that because we are in danger of of creating further mental health issues for for family members down down the line so it's important that we're professional so that's why you have to be specifically trained uh you are you are a volunteer i say that i was volunteered it was in the early days i was in the office the person that was supposed to go didn't uh, couldn't make it so i ended up going instead and i'm really really glad i did because without doubt um it's a secondary duty as well i, I should say it, you do it on top of your normal day job but the other thing that stems from the McPherson report is that if you are assigned as a family liaison officer to a family, that's all you do. So if your day job, like, for instance, mine was uh, in the intelligence world on the murder squad. And, and as I went through my through my career, mine was mainly intelligence based. Uh, if a family liaison job came up, I would not do that. I, I would do the family liaison role as opposed to anything else there. So it, it was totally dedicated role but it's a bit of a misnomer because it sits on top of all our, our other our, our other roles that we do so i don't do it 24 hours a day i did it as and when uh, was was needed so in short that's really what it is it's the link um, between the family and the investigating officer and it's evolved over time and it's evolved since the tsunami because prior to that it was only for sort of murder victims and, and manslaughter victims and that but the tsunami brought out a whole sort of um you know it was clear that, that there were going to be a significant amount of victims it was clear that there were going to be a whole load of problems and so uh, the decision was made to deploy family liaison officers through, throughout um throughout the country uh, even though we are very, very, you know, in its infancy, basically, FLO was it was them. But, uh, you know, across the country, everyone stood up. And I think uh, it's it's really good to say that that the tsunami was the first test and and, and bridge policing, uh, you know, passed that test in terms of family liaison, but, uh, for sure, because they provided uh, significant support uh, in in, in a sort of new kind of scenario, we, we'd never had a situation where we were dealing with the death of a you know, quarter of a million people, uh, where we had to sort of try and trace the 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 the, the, the individual the British nationals that had died in that as well. So, um, yeah, that was incredibly challenging. But that was that it opened up FLOing to a wider audience. You know, it was taken away. It was, you know, just it was taken away from just being murder, manslaughter, and then went it on to went on to support the DVI, the disaster victim identification process. And in terms of of that, it's 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 uh, an essential support service, I would say, for the for the DVI uh, process. I'm sure many of your your, your listeners will understand the DVI process. Uh, they'll know that if there's a, a mass casualty event abroad. Uh, there's this this whole team of officers that descend on, on wherever it is uh, and, and and basically do exactly as it says on the team, identify the victims and make sure that they get back to their loved ones as quickly as possible. And certainly in the UK, uh, the FLOs plays a vital role in that liaison between, you know, the authorities in the UK, at the DVI abroad and, you know, what we're doing and what we're doing with the, with the families here. So in a nutshell... That's the sort of quick, uh, quick history. It's got, it's evolved. It's come from Stephen Lawrence. It's, uh, it's evolved from just being used in a murder, murder squad um, sort of environment, and it's evolved in, in these mass casualty abroad 
uh, type type uh, scenarios. And and obviously, I was in the tsunami, and that's where my sort of expertise in deaths abroad has 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 come has arisen from. Because since then, that's mostly what I've been dealing with is, is deaths overseas. So, do you think there's a sort of specific type of personality that's suited yeah. to the role? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, and see, I, I, policing doesn't get the, the, the credit it deserves for for uh, it, the communication skills that, in, that is entrenched in, in pretty much every officer. And it is utilised from from almost day one, you know, when they go out into the street. Uh, and then, you know, uh, you know, they, they spend uh, officers spend every day sort of talking to people, trying to calm situations up, trying to deal with vulnerable people. And that expands into, you know, uh, other roles within policing, like the the, the 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 people that deal with with rape victims or the child sex exploitation offences. What you did in Parliament, in, uh, you know, all that that sort of challenging sort of communication skills. And one of the things um, that an FLO need is obviously that elevated communication, be able to talk to people properly. They also need to know exactly what the process is. But most of all, uh, and this is where where um, you know, FLOs, you can apply to be an FLO. It's not as easy as people think because you need to, have to convince the um, sort of person, the, the coordinator who decides that you're going to be an FLO, that you've got that empathy, that you've got that compassion, uh, you've got that desire to not only work for the victim, you know, victim's family, but also to work for the investigation. So that, that you're not there for the victim. You're actually there for the investigation. You know, even if it's a, coron a, cor a coroner's investigation, you need to have those skills. You need to be able to set aside your personal feelings toward, towards the victim, not get too engrossed, but at the same time, be as sympathetic and compassionate and empathetic as you possibly can. So it's not for some people. It, it really isn't. Um, and that there are, you know, proper long-term police officers that I've known that said they would go nowhere near being a, a family as an officer and it is the most challenging role that I've, I've, I've ever had sitting in, the, in that in that room with people who are at the lowest of the low because they've lost their, their, their loved ones uh, and you know they they desperately need our, our, our support and, and our help and um, it's most challenging but also the most rewarding sort of uh, role I've ever performed. And, and has it now been copied overseas and other and other places now so i've heard there's a good, that some good stuff coming out of australia you know so i know australia are doing uh, are doing some good stuff over there i know that uh, when i certainly when i was in uh, so 15 characters and command we were looking at the officers were going over there to sort of train up family liaison and officers uh, as it is and belgium were quite interested um so there's a similar sort of role in in America, but not as widespread as as it should be. But nowhere is uh, have you got complete coverage in every police force in the country like you do in in the UK. And nowhere do you, do you have the numbers that that we do have over here. And the, also the protocols experience. You know, uh, we should pre we should pat ourselves on the back, British policing, for for what we've done. And it's had a, uh, in, in FLO work, and it's had massive impact. Uh, you know, things like courts have changed because of family liaison officers. So in the old days, the family used to sit up in the public gallery and they used to sit next to the um, they used to sit next to the suspect's uh, family. Suspect's family are more than entitled to be there, more than entitled to be supportive of, of their of their of their their loved one as well. But obviously that caused tension, uh, you know, and, and it, it caused it caused, you know, further, further sort of hardship for, for family members. So because of FLOs, we've managed to get them down in the well of the court, keep them away from where they end. You know, things like that, impact statements. Impact statements used to be, where well, you know, used to be just a thing. And the judge used to read these impact statements. And those of you who don't know what an impact statement is, it's exactly what it says on the tin in that uh, an FLO will go to towards the family. And they will say, "Tell us exactly what this is, what has happened to you subsequently since the, uh, the death of your loved ones. You know the impact it, it's had on you, and you'll have that a uh, quite a lengthy, lengthy, lengthy statement which personifies the victim." Now, now that used to be just read out, but actually it, it's become quite an important part of British, the British legal system. And I certainly know uh, in the SUS 
uh, sort of coronial process after after the attack in in, in Suth, um, we had a very innovative coroner, and he he, he was uh, he was sort of saying, Let, let's get the families to 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 say something about their 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 family members, you know, to actually personify, to to make that you know it's not just a name on on a sheet, so that the families remember families were given the t- opportunity to speak about their loved ones in terms more than just the last couple of minutes of their their lives, uh, which is it, it, it actually humanizes court really, you know, and it's in, it's it's incredible that it, we've come that far. And because of that, and it's it's down to family liaison officers, it's down to FLOs going into judges' chambers and saying, can we move them because of this? And it's just generally being accepted, you know. Family liaison officers are, are usually d- uh, detective constables, maybe detective sergeants. Uh, they are sort of in the, in the terms of the rank structure that they are, uh, you know, uh, on the on the bottom rung, but they have a massive influence. M- the more the biggest influence that any other uh, DC detective constable will have. Is within within FLO because uh, superintendents will listen to FLOs, uh, will listen to their advice. Judges will listen, you know, on a, you know, on occasion. So they have this this huge uh, sort of influence, and that's why you need to be you need to be level headed. You need to be compassionate. You need to be thinking, um, you know, to be enthusiastic about, uh, about the role. So yeah, there are a whole host of of of, of traits that you need. So uh, what well, one of the things is always interested in me is how do you i mean you know i've obviously worked on murder inquiries like you have and you know they rarely last weeks they last months some of them last years so yeah. that, you, you must build an incredible relationship with those family members so how at the end of it you know what's how, how do you kind of extricate from that what's the exit strategy for that well uh, you uh, the, the exit strategy is begins the, the day you meet them you know you you spend a lot of time with the family initially uh, and you become, um, you know, you become a real part of their support network. You also identify their support network and you, you, you know, you try and get that involved with them as, as, as much as possible. But we have to move on because uh, as we go through the process, we, we get to sort of lessen our involvement with, with, with the families. So we've gone from sort of daily as it goes on and we've, we've arrested someone and as that process goes on to, to weekly to sort of an, as and when it happens. And we slowly sort of extricate ourselves out, out of that. Now, it's really, really difficult, the exit strategy, because ideally what we're looking for is the day that the, the court is finished, you know, a day or two after the court is finished, we are saying thank you very much. You know uh, that's that that's that you don't really need this anymore, and hopefully everything's been put in place that they don't need you. Now, the the, the old adage is that every time I walked into the room, I took them back to the day, the first day I walked into the room. So I've spoken with many a family five, six years after we, when we've done training events. They remember what I said. You know, I barely remember what I said, but they remembered. They remembered exactly what I said, word for word. So there's that in that sort of relationship form, but it's not necessarily a healthy relationship as it goes forward because it, it, it does impact on their mental health. It doesn't allow them to move forward. So the answer to that is, it's an it, it, we, we extra ourselves when we can, when we feel that we've done absolutely everything for the family. And generally that's around the, when the court proceedings have done. Right? But if they need more support, if they need help, all right, an FLO can stay for some time. And I know of FLOs that have, have stayed for a couple of years after, after, after court cases for, for a whole host of, of reasons. And that, again, is down to the family liaison coordinator. The coordinator sits just above the family liaison officers and is usually a... Um, it's usually a, a supervisory uh, a rank, uh, and they are the ones that sort of monitor that. They sort of decide how long the family support is, is required. Um, they're really they've they've been FLOs themselves. They're really really good at that sort of thing, uh, and and recognizing uh, the family's needs. Um, so you know it, it, it's a moving sort of it's it, it's a moving feature, but. Uh, as soon as possible, because we bring trauma, we bring back the memories, uh, and you know they need to get on with their lives, and they need to get um, they need to get back to the, their 
their new normal because obviously it's, it's going to be completely different for them after that event but they need to get back to as normal a life as they possibly can and having police officers floating around can be detrimental so obviously you worked with the FLO on overseas deployments have you so I just wondered with it when you know, when you look back and reflect what are the common themes that come up um you know what what worked really well and what lessons do you think still can be learned it's a really difficult question that because so i've been involved with with um repatriations from abroad since the tsunami uh you know and and, and most continents i've done something or other uh, with people uh being brought back and liaising with their family including you know places like somalia when we had contractors killed over there and uh you know places that we could never deploy as a, as, as FLO. Now, in every country, it is different. The rules and regulations are different. Um, the cultural uh, aspect of death is, is different. You know, undertakers and that process is completely and utterly different. The, the, the common theme is the ability to sort of adapt, uh, not go, not sort of, it, it's, it's to learn on the job, to 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 get it to to fit into what they that that, that particular country is, is dealing with or, or the way that they deal with it um and it's it, it's really really complex uh it's not an easy uh, easy situation to do um bringing back a body uh is is expensive very expensive and it, it's in the thousands i think it starts off about six thousand pounds and bodies have to go in in um in certain flights and certain kind of planes that have got licenses they have to go in certain kind of uh, sort of canisters and, and in this case it's lead line coffins obviously uh, and that is an expensive business it does, and there's only two or three companies that to, sort of specialize in, in bringing bodies back and whilst there's, this, there's hundreds of companies that will bring bodies back there's only two that physic two or three that actually physically bring 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 bodies back back to the uk um uh so that's 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 the common thing. The, the second thing is, I have noticed, uh, and I'm going to be slightly controversial here, um, that since I've left the, the police and I've been sort of helping people with uh, uh, matters that are not counter terror related or mass casualty uh, related, um, that it's even harder for the families to get um, sort of support. Uh, and to get sort of help. Uh, and I've, uh, the all-party parliamentary group is, is the classic example, really. I came about the all-party parliamentary group on deaths abroad. Uh, I read their report in 2019, and it's a literally, you know, it's a long, long a, 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 a stories of where families have had so much difficulties getting their loved one back, where, uh, and particularly when it's a murder or a manslaughter, where they haven't got the answers that they would have if they'd been over here. They haven't even got close to getting those answers uh, as well. Um, and the FCO, uh, FCDO now, is going, uh, I, uh, uh, the best team I ever worked in in my 35 years of service were run by FCO, the rapid deployment team within the FCO, and they are outstanding. Um, in times the mass crisis then. But I think they are found a little bit wanting in individual uh, deaths, uh, and be that murder, be that um, uh, a, a, an accident, you know, someone falling from from a, uh, a balcony in Magaluf, that, that sort of stuff as well. Um, so, so in that respect, yeah, the, the FCO need to step up their game a little bit. They need to maybe appreciate that it's 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 very very difficult for families, uh, and, and nowadays families the most the best support families get are from the charities like you know uh, murdered abroad like like um, like, like uh, the Lucy Blackman Trust or all these these sort of uh, these charities uh, death alone um, death abroad you're not alone up in Scotland. The, the, these sort of charities do an awful lot of support and an awful lot of guidance for for people for family members uh, uh, abroad. Um, so so yeah, that 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 
that is an aspect that desperately, desperately needs to be looked at. And I know how well it is because I've done it in Seuss and I've done it in the in Brussels. And I know that if we've got a government support, how brilliantly they do it, you know. And um, yeah, you know, so so it can be done. It can be done. The government, yeah, certainly, the FCO need to step up a little bit, and have a look at it, and and not not dismiss uh, people's concerns as they. They are. I'm, I might be being a bit harsh on them there, but they, they, certainly a lot of the family members that I speak to now, and I speak to an awful lot of them, uh, have got problems with the FCO and the way that they, they, they sort of behave and have done yeah. in the past. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean I've had one experience um, many years ago in, in Laos, where a British national, yeah. you know, and they were awful, um, I have to say. Yeah. Um, so moving on then. So. So moving out from the, you know, from the policing environment and government environment into the commercial world. So how, yeah. we, how, how do you kind of take what you know from that world, from the previous world? What are right. the kind of lessons and, and good practices and the benefits of the commercial sector having someone who specializes in that environment? Right. So there's a number of strands to that. So... This this journey for me started when I uh, first of all it started when I was in when I was dealing with the tsunami and I spent a lot of time dealing with the reps that were over there and they were a vital link to to, to, to us. Um, is, it, is this the holiday they, reps? They were, yeah, the holiday reps. Holiday, yeah, 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 sorry. Yeah. All right. So they were really good, and uh, I was speaking to them saying, you know, do you get any sort of training on this? And they went, no. I mean, I've no, I'm making this up as they go along. This is, you know, this is this is madness. And oh, okay, so and then we fast forward to 2015, you know, 10, 10 years later, uh, when I'm in Seuss and I'm dealing with with the holiday reps there, who again, uh, you know, I don't want to sound critical of the holiday industry as well, but they, these these were young people. Uh, who who had had to face significant trauma? They'd had to deal with uh, multiple, you know, multiple deaths and crises amongst, you know, client uh, amongst holiday makers that they were there to make sure that their 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 holiday was as good as it possibly could be, and you know they cope they coped admirably. Um, but I worry about the effect that it that it would have or have on them. And this is why when I when I came out of the, the, the police, um, I sort of. Uh, touted my services around to the, to the holiday industry and say, look, myself and my uh, my friend uh, Steve Chalice, uh, we've who um, was a family liaison officer with me as well, we've uh, we've got this um, sort of course and it, and it's all about dealing with the bereaved, and that in itself is a skill uh, which I don't I think people underestimate. Um, there are things that you say that you do that if you say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing, all right, that is going to a, affect the relationship with that family, and uh, and b make the the sort of uh, the, their 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 journey back to sort of their new normal it's traumatic for them. Uh, you know, and the the amount of times where I've I've heard people say to me, it, it, certainly in the commercial sector, yeah, I treat them. Uh, I treat the family as if it had been my own mother that had died. And I go, well, but it wasn't your mother that died, is it? You know, and it wasn't your mother that died in, in those circumstances. So, so uh, you know, it shouldn't be about you. It should be uh, 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 about them. And that's that's one of the things, you know, I, I, I've heard people say, you know, I know how I, I know how you feel. Well, no, you don't. Even, <laughs> you know, even if you've not suffered a bereavement, you do not know how they, they that, that individual has, has felt. So so there are things that you, you shouldn't be saying to, to, to family members. You shouldn't be making about yourselves. Um, you shouldn't be making decisions for the family uh, 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 as well, because people do that. People make make decisions, and, and senior investigating officers uh, used to be pretty bad at it. They've subsequently changed. So I've I've had a family who asked to um, they wanted the clothes that um, their son who had been stabbed to death in, and they wanted those clothes, and uh, and right, okay, we had them, uh, and we we got them, and then the SO said, "No, we're going to clean them up because we're not going to give them, you know, clothes." That they and I sat and argued with them that they, they want that those clothes as they are. And as it was, the, the SIO went, okay, all right, if that's what they want. And we boxed it up and it was really nice. We didn't just give them an exhibit bag. To the best of my knowledge, that box has never been opened, but it's there in, in that house. So that's an example of not making decisions for family, not judging uh, families as well. And and people who, 
who don't have any experience with families in this bere- in this bereaved state don't recognize that uh and and so that's where it, it's pretty dangerous to ask for someone to to get involved because they are either in hr or they are a friend of, of the person who's lost because whilst i'm sure they do they, with the best will in the world they're they're doing as a, a, as good a job as they possibly can all right it may be not the job that is required for that family and it might also have the impact on the individual doing the role um because it's incredibly stressful it's it's incredibly hard work to sit in that room with traumatized people and they are looking to you for answers and you know that's that's one of my big things is certainly in, since since I, since i left is that people need to realize it's not it's not a skill that you pick up you know it's a skill that you have to have been taught it's a skill that you have to have learned and 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 have have experience from because if you don't you're going to cause damage to that family's recovery and well, that, it, it, me, but it strikes me also that 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 whole issue around for instance and i know that we used to kind of struggle with it when the back in the early days of murder inquiries around someone from a different religion who has different rules around yeah. how they treat death and how, you know the, the 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 timeline between burial and all those complexities which yeah. become a minefield and create problems in that relationship if you if they're not understood and managed yeah yeah absolutely and and you and you take it one step further as well if you think about uh when someone is shot by police they are provided with a family liaison officer and how difficult must that be <laughs> you know the, the skill set rec- those those officers have got um it, you know is is really really um uh sort of Im- immense really but you could turn that into the commercial world as well because there are there are sort of instances industrial incidents a- accidents maybe where the company involved may have may have some sort of uh you know involvement in in, in the death for 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 a whole host of reasons um having an FLO with that family all right mitigates the sort of um uh you know it, uh, in years to come when it, it reaches court you know it, it sort of mitigates the the um the risk to, to that the the, the, the the family may cause um sort of publicly mm-hmm. you know it helps it helps them uh, it's, it's by providing that support helps the family immensely you know, even if they've got issues with the individual company, the fact that they've got someone like me who's independent coming along and helping them as much as possibly, mm. all right, that sort of almost mitigates the the, the feelings towards that that individual uh, company, and it sh- also shows that, that you know that this is a company that, that puts its employees first. And whilst there was this issue here, generally we we put our we put our, we put our, um, our our employees first. So, so that that sort of thing. Um, you know, is where I bought it from the police, where I've made my, the communication skills that, we, that we've got. Um, so I'm not really a, a crisis management company. Uh, my, I, what I do is sort out trauma, critical incidents, where the heart of the matter is a, a human being, where there's a problem with the human being who may be essential to the, the, the machine of the company uh, that, 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 that they work for, the organisation that they work for. Um, and, and so that's mainly my role, my role, is to make sure that that individual is back working uh, as effectively as they possibly could do in the, uh, in, in the circumstances, in, in circumstances as quickly as possible. And so I generally work with people, A, that are see it morally as, as their duty to provide support to, to um, bereaved uh, or, or, or people who are seriously injured ab- ab- abroad, uh, and be people who are companies that are victim focused, that, not victim focused, sorry, fa- uh, employee focused, that see that crisis management companies provide a brilliant service and there's some fantastic people out there do, doing some great work. Uh, and you see that on LinkedIn, especially your stuff like, you know, Inherent Risks and, and Dan Kane stuff. The stuff that he does is amazing, and I'm a big fan. But, but but we take it that little bit further, uh, uh, or we actually we don't take it further. We we be, we do a bit more bespoke. So it is all about the individual, and it might not just be bereaved. 
it might not just be dealing with someone who's lost um, lost a loved one and getting doing providing all that practical support. It'll be so. For instance, the last um, the last sort of job we're dealing with was someone who witnessed a serious crime, a murder, in front of them abroad, uh, and the support that we've sort of put in, we put in practical support about helping helping that individual, helping the family is a wide picture as well. We weren't even in the country at the time, but you know, I've got their own sort of issues that have arisen from it. Getting support in with the family, and at the same time, getting in the mental health. Um, sort of support with with the um, the trauma psychologists we work with, Mark Bradley, who is one of the leading experts in in, in the world uh, in, in in that respect, and getting that sort of quick response. Um, so you know we, we've managed to, uh, for instance, we in one particular job we were three weeks behind the curve because we came in uh, we didn't have a pre existing relationship with the, with the, with the people, but we managed to get the better support in within sort of about a week. And that would have never have ever been taking place if that, that, that individual had gone to their GP, had gone to a private sort of counselling session and that sort of stuff. It would never have happened because of obviously COVID's caused significant delays amongst that, that, um, that uh, in, in that area. Uh, but we managed to, we, you know, with our contacts and, and, and our experience, we've managed to get support in it a lot, lot quicker. And because of that, because of all the sort of, you know, we've the practical side where we've looked after him, we've looked after the mum and dad, you know, his family, friends, helped and advised him in, in about the police contact and all that sort of stuff. And on top of the, the mental health support, that employee will be in his new normal a lot quicker mm. than if they had to do it all on his own. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, what, what strikes me is when I think about this, I think about, you know, when, when we're looking at, for instance, um, some of the reporters and journalists are out in Ukraine at the moment. Yeah. Do they get that? You know, do the, do the kind of, do the, the big media companies provide that support to them? I know they provide the risk support, but they, do they provide your support as well? Well, I, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I, I, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, I, I, but, they, they, you know, we see that all the time, don't we? We see people disappearing off all the time. And uh, without a doubt, they will have some kind of crisis management uh, company there with them, helping them uh, and doing all the sort of close protection side of thing. If they needed extracting, getting them out. Uh, and there will be local people in place as well, providing all that. That's all. But the long term, the practical support after, if something bad happens, if, if a reporter is killed or something like that, I don't know is the answer. Right. Uh, no one's come to me and said, yeah. you know, uh, or I don't know of any FLOs that are working for those companies. And I know quite a lot of, of family liaison officers. Um, I, I, you see, I, I don't think a lot of people know about yeah. family liaison officers. That's know, the purpose I of this call. Yeah. So, so what about what about the oil companies, you know, the offshore oil companies and those sort of things? Again, high-risk employment, high-risk environments are working where the families are left behind, if you like, and, and it's pretty much like the military being deployed you know, are they, yeah. do they have that sort of thing? Yeah. I, I, again, I would say that they would, you know, because generally the world we live in nowadays, people would try and help, try and help as much as they could. And I would say they would just go straight to sort of like the psychological side of things, help, help in that respect. But quite often, um, it's the practical side. The practical side is as, as important as the psychological side. Uh, because it's a minefield, it's complex, you, and you can't sort of just deal with that with a session with a, with a psychiatrist or or a, or a trauma counsellor. You can't just deal with that. You need help in understanding that the, the um, sort of processes that that, that that happened after someone died. You need help understanding what went on, and you know, and, and an FLO will bring that sort of support. They'll they'll bring that. A lot of families want to go to where the where their loved one died. All right. And now that, that to a lot of people that sounds like, why would they want to go there? Well, they do. <laughs> uh, you don't ask why, they do. And that's part of their, their, their sort of healing process. So, so they want to go there. Now, if that means going out to an oil rig, you'd have the likes of me saying, right, let's get my oil rig. We'd go over there, we'd support them, and, and, and they would see exactly where it happened. So it gets that in their head. Families are awake at three o'clock in the morning thinking about stuff like that. You know, and if we can solve those problems, it might be that they'll for an hour or two they won't be thinking about things but like do, that. So you, you know but, what I mean. But so, do, you, do you think the companies 
are resistant because they worry that if we show where the families where it happened, this is you know they might be thinking about the negligence angle and all that sort of stuff. So they're not thinking about the family; they're worrying about the kind of legal position of themselves and their their kind of duty of care and all that sort of stuff. I, I think that could be the case in the past, but I think nowadays I think that people are beginning to realise that you know I think the world's changing and that the, the moral duty of care. Um, you know, it doesn't really need to be written in statutes in, in, in rules and regulations and stuff like that. I think people are generally going, you know what, we maybe need to do a little bit more. And I think we fill that space. Yeah. We, 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 the brilliant work that the crisis management teams do, we step up, a, we, we sort of add to that. We, we, we add a little bit more um, with our skills, with our experience, with our knowledge, you know, uh, and with our outlook, you know, <laughs> so we sort of add to that. So what about uh, um, what about um, UK? So not, you, you know you, they're, they're a UK resident, but they're not a UK national, and they're working overseas with a British company. Can you help them? Yeah. Or do they have to be yeah. a British national? No, 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 no. I, I've I've helped Italians in Italy, <laughs> you know, because it, they were they were part of a pro they were part of people that we were helping. All right, so I've gone and helped them because that's part of the wider picture. All right, it, it, it made it better for the company I was working for, mm-hmm. for the people I was. So, you, so really, so, what you're saying is, the skills you have it, are transferable anywhere in the world. Now, clearly, there'll, oh, be, yeah. there'll probably be different processes in terms of, yeah. you know, how do you get a body back to Germany or, or yeah. Belgium or yeah. the US, what have you? Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the core skill of 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 understanding how to engage, how to how to liaise, as in the you know, and, yeah. uh, are the are the kind of that's the real selling point about because I, I mean I remember I remember when we were talking ages ago about um, yeah one of the big lawsuits around one of the holiday companies that was um, that was in, that was going on and I remember saying to you do you think if you if they had got you on board at really early doors they did but they'd be in this place right now um, uh. and, <laughs> and, and you know and, and it was a really interesting conversation because they be, they become this kind of we can't talk to the families because this is big lawsuit one or something. And, and they, and all they do is kind of create this, this widening void between them and the families when probably what they need to be doing is the opposite. Yeah. And if you think about what I said about right at the beginning of this, their attitude can be, uh, you know, is similar to what murder squads were mm-hmm. like before, before Stephen Lawrence and, mm-hmm. uh, and that sort of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, there is benefit to engaging professionally mm-hmm. with families. We're providing that, that support and getting a link in, you know, because uh, there's there's all kinds of models about grief. Uh, there's like five stages, there's seven stages, and there's different sort of sort of saying that, that different sort of stages that people go through. And you know, there's all kinds of models like that. I wouldn't claim to be an expert. But what I am an expert in is um, the, there's one stage that is pretty consistent, and that's anger. Mm. And people can be angry for twenty years mm. and more about an incident that that happened. You know, there, there, are, there are people that work in these charities. They, 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 they work in the charities because they are angry about what happened and they want to change it for the people that, 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 um, that, that have to experience that trauma after, after them. And so in terms of a, a, a company, um, in my experience, and it's the same within the police as well, they, the, the family's anger will be directed towards wh- whoever they feel is responsible. So if you've got an FLO in there, uh, and it certainly works towards the, towards the police, because because when mistakes are made, we go in and say this mistake has been made. We don't we you know, we are open, transparent, and we are we are completely honest. And I've been guilty of making mistakes in my time as an FLO, and I've learned from them. Uh, but as long as we get in there and, and and tell the family as quickly as possible, generally, families are quite accepting of that. Generally. You know, and so we we not only do we um, help the families through that section, we sort of almost try and take away that anger towards the organisation that they feel is is responsible. Mm-hmm. Now it doesn't always work. You know, you're going to get sometimes where you know there's something went so dramatically wrong uh, that they they are never going to get past that. But having myself and my, you know FLOs in there with them, uh, it helps them. Uh, and, and and it helps them, and in, in turn, it helps the organisation that that I would be working for, the client that I, mm. I would be working for. It's it's uh, interesting because the, 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 some of the work that we do in Diffuse now is um, 
when an individual becomes fixated and uh, because of a grievance fixated on a chief well, yeah. executive or whatever else and what what's yeah. really interesting is when you when you when you drill dra- drill down into that that grievance very often it's a misunderstanding they yeah. they don't know the facts and they've they yeah. fill the gaps in themselves so i'm thinking yeah. you know someone like you know the flo role in that environment yeah is an independent person who might be able to actually resolve that grievance at a very early stage. Absolutely. And, and you know, that's, that's the beauty of your, your diffuse, is that, you know, if someone comes to you early enough with an issue, all right, it might not need a hard, it, you know, it, it could just mean a chat, someone knocking on the door and saying, listen, let's have a talk, let's walk this through. This is their process. This is what's happened. And, you know, you know, not only is that good for the company, but it's good for the person as well. <laughs> you know, they get a bit of an understanding and they're able to sort themselves out. And, 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 and you know, I'm not going to say, it ha- I'm not going to say it's a perfect Nirvana situation where it'll, it'll all be sorted because it, it you know, it, it might not be. But definitely employing those skills, uh, FLO skills, policing skills, um, I, I can't think of anything, uh, you know, it's, it, it's the best way to do that sort of thing. You know, best way to to address that problem is to communicate as quickly as, uh, as possible. The best way to make lives easier for me is to get the communication in, get the support in, get it, get it in as as quickly as humanly possible. You know, so yeah, so you're certainly right, and and I'm sure um, that's what you do. You know, you're one of the great communicators, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, and so, um, uh, you know, that 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 sort of um, talking one-to-one personal having a uh, having a face rather than over the phone i, I don't like doing stuff with the phone i want to sit in i want to i want to know you know i want to look into the whites of the eyes of the person i'm dealing with whether they're a victim or or in, you know in, as your case someone who's got a grievance and i want to know how they're feeling and because of what we've done over the last three decades we know we get that sort of insight we know don't we we can pretty much make an assessment of individuals when we sit in a room with them uh, and we know whether they're gonna they're gonna have problems in the future we know what we need to do to try and sort their, their, them out as well so yeah i definitely think policing skills and and sort of family liaison skills uh underused um uh but i think we're changing i think you know recently we're getting more and more people having a look at us you know so the crisis management plus we're in a, a bolt onto a, a crisis management team um because i think we had that professionalism and we had that skills uh and and most of all we have we had that support to the family that needed it most time so coming towards the end of this podcast and let's let's think about what you know all your experiences flo and, and all those bits what would your five tips then be for the commercial world in respect to the benefits of having an FLO? Right. Five tips. Wow. So, I mean, the first tip is get us involved before the incident happens. Uh, and I know, I know the world is, you know, is, is, is money, it, it has, they've got budgets and they've got, you know, they've got costs to worry about. All right. But if you get us involved, before the incident has happened, all right, you stand a lot better chance of containing the incident um, uh, quicker, quickly. So, in, for instance, in this, this case that you know we're doing a couple of things. You know, one of the cases we were we were four weeks behind, <laughs> and and so we're now a month behind, and that's that's that ha- is a massive problem for us. But it's not an overachievable. But if that company, if we had a pre-existing relationship with them, and we were there on day one or day two because it was obviously abroad uh, we could have done a whole lot more and we would have been further down the track than we are now so so, it, so, so is that is that about training or it's about having the well, relationship there so that they've got you on call so that if they're in a high risk kind of commercial environment they know that that if there's something happening they can get you deployed within 24 hours yeah so that was my second basis is is, is training all right. So you have us there as a as a, 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 as a facility to go, as an option to go as quickly as human possible, and try and sort the issue out as quickly as possible. All right. But in the meantime, what you also need is people that may interact. So, like holiday reps is a classic example. Holiday reps um, should be trained in how to deal with the breed, 
or those that are seriously injured and you know people are suffering significant trauma uh, they should be i don't know why it's not mandatory i don't know why why companies don't think oh hold on this is a risk because a family um a family say the kid that falls from the beach and uh, from the balcony in magaluf you know a family will probably go over there um they will not get they will get a little bit of support but not get the, the answers and support that they they, they probably want uh, and they've got access to social media and you know that all of a sudden you're not controlling it you're, you know it's getting out of hand because they haven't got uh, a suitably trained person that would have met them off the flight that knows about what i said earlier how to talk to people who are brief how, what to say what to do that sort of thing so that, that um, kind of whole reputational risk then huge. is massive massive huge you know uh, and you only need one incident and it can it can ruin you you know if you don't handle that properly it, 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 it could ruin you and it's not expensive that's the annoying thing all right is that you to train your staff up is is pretty cheap to do, to, to do it as you know you know cross cost rewards uh basis it, it, it is pretty pretty cheap to do it. and to you know it provides you with that sort of security that it can be dealt with until people like myself uh the professionals can come in and actually take over and, and deal with it with it as as they should do as it should be done like that. Uh, yeah, so that would be the, the sort of second thing I would say is definitely get us, get us on board. And secondly, train your staff, your front name staff that, w- that will be there to deal with it. And it's had benefits. So, for instance, we did some, we did a, one of the holiday teams, um, Party Hard, brilliant little firm uh, that work out of Manchester now. Uh, and we trained up all their sort of resort reps. Uh, and we, um, I was actually on holiday in um, uh, in Corfu, so I went down to Cavos and I spoke to the resort manager there, and she said that um, uh, they had a serious injury on the beach, nothing to do with them. It wasn't their their holiday company that was responsible, but she was like one of the first people on scene, and she said everything that we taught her just clicked into place. You know, all about how to talk to people and, and all, mainly about recording information, you know, that, that sort of thing. It just clicked into place. And she dealt with that incredibly well because of that. She had that sort of basis. She, she obviously is, is a, a very switched on person, but she had that sort of training. She had that sort of underpinning that enabled her to enact it, uh, to, to get into it and, and, and deal with it as effectively as possible. And then it was really the best feedback I've ever had is when someone comes back to you and said, we had this and because of what you did, we did exactly this and it worked. Well, it's proof of concept, isn't it? It is. And, you know, that's a 22-year-old, 22-year-old that is giving you, you know, sort of feedback and that Mm. that they've had that that sort of, um, that sort of trauma training and they've they've done well out out of it as well. Uh, And so in terms of that, I would also say the third sort of thing I would say is um, look after your staff. it's it's very easy to um, sort of assign staff members to help, you know, the family members who are, you know, in in the case of where someone's died, like for instance, a banker, uh, a banker died in the Middle East, natural causes, no no suspicion whatsoever. All right, but obviously left behind, he died quite young, left behind quite a um, an extensive family, um, uh, and. It was decision was made that his his friend would be this link would be the support and they didn't they didn't they didn't have a relationship with us uh, but I knew the family so I was speaking to the family and helping them and I sort of spoke to this guy and said really I, I don't think you're the best person and I gave him, I, you know I'm, I'm paraphrasing what I'm saying I gave him the whole reason why but he decided to do it. And he, he committed all the mistakes <laughs> you know he that, that, that well meaning well meaning mistakes well-meaning mm. you know and it had an effect on him because all of a sudden he was being challenged by family members of a person that he loved mm. and he was as well experiencing trauma of the death as well yeah, yeah. you know so you need to so i would say if you're going to do that uh companies if you're going to do that all right don't make it a mate you know make it someone who uh, and make it someone who can do it full time for a couple of weeks that hasn't got a day job that isn't worried about, that isn't looking at their emails on the phone that isn't worried isn't fielding a million calls at the same time as that take them away from it and, and, and do that you know that, that that is vitally vitally important to to, to me have a dedicated job uh, and and try and get the right person to do it and don't think just because he's a mate you know that that's the best thing and the other thing as well in terms of them um, 
from that is that you have if someone when someone dies within a within a, an organization it has an impact on everyone around and we know that don't we because mm. unfortunately mm. you know we we've known people that have mm. that have been killed in the line of duty don't we mm. and we we still remember them now don't we mm. yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, we also yeah, yeah. people People that died naturally, as you know, we, we we still raise a drink to them on on the so it has an impact, you know, and that sort of deal with dealing with the wider circle as, uh, as well, and it's recognizing that. So that's four that's points then, because we've got we've got. Um, you're running out of time. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah, but it's not that. But we, you know, I think you've got looking after your people is one, and then yeah. the second one is obviously you know don't use friend. a friend as yeah. the liaison point. So what would your yeah. last kind of tip be then? Ooh, come on, come on, come up with something good now. <laughs> <laughs> well i i think it, it's my big tip and it's uh, is always about dealing with the family all right um and and it and it's the three that, that I, I sort of mentioned earlier but it's huge and it should have actually been number one if you are going to deal with the family if you're not going to have us there right okay that, that's fine but be open and honest about it. Be, you know, tell people exactly what's going on. If there are mistakes made in bringing the body back, you know, for instance, sometimes bodies can take them days to get back, right? Find out why and tell them, all right? And if it's, uh, you know, if they shout at you, just go, yeah, yeah, I'm keep on, I, I'm, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Yeah. Because, so transparency. You know, transparency, be honest, be do that and that. And the second thing is, again, I, I can't emphasize this enough. Do not go along the lines of, oh, I've been bereaved. Mm. This is how I dealt with it. You know, do not ever, ever, ever go along, along the lines of, of that. And the third thing is, look after yourself. Mm. You know, that's really important to, 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 to me. Manage your own so, Yeah. So the, the guy, you know, I talk about in, in the Middle East didn't look after himself. Uh, and I was sort of ringing him up saying, you're right, you're right. He didn't really want to talk to me. And in the end, I thought, you know, well, I'm, I'm being in an inconvenience here. So I didn't. Uh, and I know that he struggled. Mm. He struggled. And he then had counselling provided by the organisation he worked for. And it was the wrong type of counselling. You, you can't have this general, uh, uh, mm. you know, all oh, right, we're, we're sending you to see a counsellor. Mm. You can't have that because each individual circumstances require a different kind of uh, counselling, a different kind of expert. All right. So that was, again, a lack of awareness. You know, people, you know, people don't want to accept that people die abroad you know or, or get seriously so, injured i mean life-changing injuries can be yeah. just as oh, yeah. just as traumatic and, and you know yeah. grief stricken yeah. absolutely you know and you know like witnesses to a murder yeah, getting yeah. arrested you know witnesses to crime getting arrested all that sort of stuff you know that has traumatic ev- yeah. a- 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 effect on people yeah. and the person that's yeah. there to help them out uh it, it's it's important that their issues that their mental health is is, is addressed as well mm. So yeah, that's in you know very quickly. Um, Wasn't that quickly? Like? We should really... <laughs> <laughs> so listen, if if people want to get hold of you and they want to either you know seek out your services or just kind of pick your brains and what have you, how do people get hold of you? I, I think the best way is to go through LinkedIn. To be honest with you, uh, is that I'm on LinkedIn quite a lot. Uh, I look at it quite a lot. Uh, if you message me, uh, you're pretty much sure you're going to get an answer with it within a couple of hours. And are, are there other Miles Mannings on LinkedIn? No, there's just me. You can see uh, New Scotland Yard Detective. That's how I sort of uh, associate myself there. So uh, um, that that sort of thing. That that's the way you want to you want to get to to me. Uh, uh, is the best possible route, really. Okay. I, I find LinkedIn quite useful in, in, in that respect. Okay, brilliant. Well, listen, thank you so much. No, thank you. Know, you. I mean, it's it's, it's um it, it's fascinating because yeah, I mean, I I like you. Obviously, I was in the place for thirty years and worked on all the various same teams as you. And yet there were bits there that I didn't know about FLO work mm. and what have you. So um, I'm yeah. sure there'll be many people that that will uh, have learned something. And I, and I, you know, I'm the, I'm of the view that if you're a company that sends any of your people overseas, or you're in an environment where it's kind of there's a risk element to your to your work in terms of um, either in the UK or overseas, I think you absolutely should be be um, using Miles' services. So. Um, you know, thank you so much for that. Listen, if you like what we're doing, then you know, like it, you know, review us, share it, subscribe. You'll find us on on all the usual uh, podcast platforms. Um, and any other questions or issues, you can always contact us at Diffuse. Um, but thank you so much for listening to the Online Bodyguard podcast. 
Thank you for listening to the Online Bodyguard podcast with host Philip Grindel, CEO and founder of Diffuse. Please rate, review, and subscribe on your favorite podcasting platforms.